In the year 2000, Parsons Brinkerhoff uh, completed a study for then Mayor Harris on a BRT program. This BRT program allowed bus rapid transit to access extended zipper lanes both in the morning and in the afternoon. And the number of riders that Parsons Brinkerhoff forecast for, the, for this bus rapid transit program was higher than the city currently projects for the rail project. And that's the same company who's now pushing rail on us. That's right. Because they do what they're told to do by the politicians who hire them. That's right. Washington State did something very unusual. Instead of telling Parsons Brinkerhoff what they wanted, they said to Parsons Brinkerhoff, what should we do to reduce our traffic congestion? Parsons Brinkerhoff did a very significant study and concluded that what was needed was the high occupancy toll lanes, that that was what was needed, and that's what they're going ahead with. In fact, that is what most jurisdictions in the United States are doing these days. Rail has not made any difference in traffic congestion anywhere, but the high occupancy toll lanes have some features about them that m m make it much easier to control traffic and reduce traffic congestion. So with that hot lane, you have free access for the carpools. Mm -hmm. You've got express buses, and then you've got excess capacity in a, in a roadway that can be used by cars that pay a modest toll and that right. helps to pay for the system. Like we have suggested a two-lane two tollway from, from uh, the Waikeli area to downtown. By charging a toll, you can control the traffic by keeping it free-flowing but full. In other words, you're adjusting the price all the time. And this, this you can see in San Diego on the, on the I-15 on San Diego, where every six minutes the price changes at a point where you can choose to go on the toll lanes or not go. And by that just subtle change all the time, they can keep everything free flowing, but full. Mm -hmm. Everybody will benefit from this, even those uh, not paying the toll who are on the H1 freeway, because traffic on the H1 freeway will be reduced accordingly. That's because right. you'll have cars going onto the hot lane, you'll have more carpools encouraged to go onto the hot lane, and therefore, mm -hmm. you'll have fewer cars flowing much more freely on the H1, not paying a toll. People object to tolls. Well, it's always voluntary. And if you have a train, you're, there's a toll right there. You're, you're paying for the train, of course, to, for your ticket to get on board. And then we're paying huge subsidies. We're all yes. paying the toll That's for right. the train. A giant toll. A, a toll that would cost $24,000 per family of four on this right. island. That's what it comes to. If you figure about $6 billion at a minimum for this train with inflation and cost overruns, you add, do the numbers. It comes to about $24,000 for family of four. Right. That's a big toll. And if we, if we come back to, to that toll lane operation, one of the f strange things about it is that the federal government has done studies of who uses the hot, the hot lanes in the community, who is in favor, who doesn't like it. And it's, what is really strange is that people are in favor of it across all income groups. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that so often, no matter what your income, you find yourself with a real need to be on time. It's either a doctor's appointment to pick up a child from daycare when they ch when they charge you excess for 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 being late and picking up your child, uh, it's a job interview, and there are many many things where we really need to be on time, and when you're paying, say, a f normal mid-range toll is going to be around four dollars. When you are late f running late for a doctor's appointment, you have an opportunity to get onto the tollway pay four dollars and be on time for your doctor's appointment, that's cheap. And as many other instances, imagine being late for a job appointment, okay, you'd, you'd pay all kinds of money to, to be able to make that appointment on time. Mm -hmm. so, so it, and this applies to everybody. 
And, and the other strange thing is that nobody, no matter what their income, nobody uses it all the time. People use it selectively. When you mm -hmm. first hear about tollways, there is a tendency to think negatively about them, but when actually used and in practice, they are favored mm -hmm. by everyone. And, and again, the other vehicles on that tollway, the carpools and the buses are benefiting tremendously. The carpools don't pay the high occupancy cars. The mm -hmm. buses have express service, unlike the train, which has to stop 21 times from one end to the other. And it'll take 51 minutes, as you say. An express bus could cut into town in 20 minutes if it has its express lane. And it, it certainly can be done. Uh, an elevated viaduct over Nimitz Highway has been discussed and planned. It's in the books for mm -hmm. decades. And it would be a relatively inexpensive thing to do. On, on a hot lane, you're really relying, that's a high occupancy lane, you're relying upon uh, the citizen to be the driver. The government is not paying that person who's driving the vehicle. Or the van pool. And the van pool, too. The, the city likes to talk about, oh, how the labor costs of a bus system would be so much more than of a rail system. Well, for one thing, that, that's kind of good. It creates jobs, and, and these are good jobs, bus driver jobs. That's an important person in our society and, and delivering an efficient product. So that's one thing. But everybody else on these express lanes is not being paid. They're maintaining their vehicles. In fact, the vehicles will last a little bit longer if they're not stuck in traffic all the time. And then the maintenance of these two systems. Imagine a rail system, a heavy rail system maintenance. You've got tracks, you've got electricity. Every station has got oh, elevators, lights, perhaps toilets. Escalators. Escalators moving constantly all the time. It's a really big machine. Can you imagine how many moving parts and how much breakdowns are going to occur with the train, with the maintenance? Compare that to a couple of road lanes made of good cement. They require very little maintenance. And then we'll have some money left over for the real maintenance that we need on the roads in our city streets, which are a wreck right now. They're a disgrace. Third world countries, Asia, uh, developing nations, all have better roads than we do. The rail project is not a done deal, much as the city would like you to believe it. We have a, a, a lawsuit that we filed against both the city and the federal government. They have made one attempt to dismiss the complaints that we've made, and the judge threw them out. We are on our way to final conclusion in about August, this coming August, and we believe that as long as we can pay all the costs involved between now and August, we will prevail in court. We've, we have the best possible attorneys for, for the project. Our lead attorney was the environmental, uh, the American Bar Association's environmental attorney of the year last year and he wrote much of the environmental law. So we, we, we do have the, the best person for the job and he strongly believes that we will prevail in federal court this August. Now, if you're opposed to this project, please send a contribution, go to honolulutraffic.com you can see the primary uh, people collecting funds for this is the SBH Foundation Rail Fund, which you can see here with the address. Just write that down and send us a contribution. Mm -hmm. it's only go, it only goes for the environmental attorneys. No, nobody else is getting paid. Mm -hmm. every, every, everyone else in this community-wide effort is working for free. Now there's another way this year that rail is not a done deal, and that's in the election that's coming up this year, the election for mayor. The public is going to have a real choice between candidates who have been 
pushing this rail system for years and a strong candidate who will be fighting against the rail system. You'll recall the referendum vote, which the city won by about a half a percent. They got 50.7% of the public to vote supposedly for rail, although the question was very vague and ambiguous. It was not a good question. And the city spent millions of dollars on misleading information that led up to that election, claiming that rail would be the cure-all for traffic, congestion would go away, and it wouldn't cost a lot of money. And they spent money on, your money, on these mailings. The union spent millions of dollars on television ads. The anti-rail side had no money for television ads. We were outgunned hundreds of ads to nothing. And this has an impact. If you repeat a misleading statement often enough, people will eventually believe it. And this is what happened on that last election. Also, since then, in the last few years, a lot more information has come out. The media has done a decent job and the costs have escalated. The economy of the country has tremendously diminished. We know that. Unfortunately, the economy of Hawaii is also in big trouble. And everybody's aware of that now. So it's a, a different ball game. It's four years later and we have another bite at the apple. We have a chance once again to make a statement as to how we feel about the future of Oahu.